Hey everybody, welcome back to another YouTube video. My name is John Hammond. We're doing some of the guide point security capture the flag competition in this video. So I have a directory created here over on my Linux virtual machine. I have the VPN file. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect to their VPN. I will sudo open VPN that file there and type in my password so I can properly run that sudo command. All right, looks like I am connected, so I will go ahead and skirt that right up there so it's not visible, and uh, we'll open up a Firefox web browser. So I can go to 10.10.100.100, which is their scoreboard here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and log in. I have this saved with LastPass. My username is Han Jammin, right? I usually like to do that because it's fun. And we'll sign in. All right, so in this video, I want to showcase uh, two challenges. I want to showcase Kirby, because that one was kind of cute and fun. And uh, I want to showcase Alphabet Soup. So, or Alphabet, right? Alphabet right here. Let's start with Kirby, though. I think that'll be kind of the most fun here. It says, uh, Kirby ate the flag for 200 points, 77 solves in the miscellaneous category. So I'm going to copy this link. And that way, once I hop over to my terminal, I'm going to call this just YouTube Kirby. There we go. And now uh, I can W get that down. Uh, when you try and do this, it will tell you like, hey, uh, we can actually verify verify the certificate because it is using HTTPS. Uh, however, it is a self-signed certificate. So W get will be kind of nice. It'll just tell you like, yo, if you want to do this, use the uh, no check certificate here. So I'm going to copy that and just run that same exact command with that flag or that arguments kind of in place. Now when I run this, looks like it's downloading, great. And I have a challenge.png with the whole token included though. So I like to typically just rename that. I'll just call it like challenge.png. There we go. All right, so it is of course a PNG image. Uh, it's just a picture of Kirby. <laughs> there it is. That's, uh, that's, that's as good as we get here, folks. Picture of Kirby. So uh, the challenge description says Kirby ate the flag and that leads me to believe that this might be using uh, like some nested files or some files inside of files or for some whatever reason, uh, image editors or image viewers, sorry, actually do an interesting thing where once it finds the end of an image file or like the ending bytes, typically the signature for the, the footer or the end of an image file, it just stops reading it'll just display the image that it can thus far. So you can like jam pack other files inside of an image file. And if you were to open it up in an image viewer, it totally doesn't care, it's not gonna read it. Uh, I wonder if that is the case here. So I would typically use some tools like Foremost or Binwalk. Um, Binwalk is super duper nice in that you can just use tack E and it'll extract it, right? If you want to use like a hard Binwalk is what I tend to call it, or like a forceful Binwalk, this syntax, for whatever reason I've like memorized, it's tack tack DD equals a dot star and then attack capital M. Don't ask me what any of that means. <laughs> I just blatantly have it memorized for whatever reason. Um, I, we could check the the Binwalk uh, man pages. I don't think I even have it installed. <laughs> I'm uh, still working on my new rig, so some of these tools I haven't pulled in all the way just yet. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and download it and I can show you that. Or you could use the syntax of foremost, right? So foremost will do a very similar thing. It'll just carve out the other known or found files within a given file, like using a scalpel, Carve all the stuff out, it is a file carver. Same thing you could end up doing with Binwalk. So uh, just to do our due dil diligence, uh, let's look for that tack DD, yeah, yeah, yeah. Extract a any type of signature given the file extension and execute command. So if you use a dot star or whatever, it's like, uh, let's just do anything. And then uh, Matryoshka or tack capital M will recursively scan extracted files. Nice, anyway. Let's use foremost. So syntax is super duper easy. Uh, the image is called challenge.png, not kirby.png. So that's what I'll type in here. Foremost that, and it found something peculiar. Did a little, uh, hey, we found out a flag.zip, although there are a lot of other random bytes in here. So foremost, we'll go ahead and create a directory in our current directory. You can see I have an output folder here now. And inside of that, 
we see PNG, so it found some image files with the PNG file itself, right? And a zip file. So examining the PNG, yeah, we've just got our picture of Kirby still. Cool, nothing extremely extravagant. Uh, let's go ahead and look at that zip file. Hmm. It is in fact a zip file, just running the file command on it. So I will go ahead and unzip that zip file. And now there is theoretically a flag.zip file here. Great, let's unzip that. Okay, now it actually came out with two files, cc.png and flag.txt. So our immediate knee-jerk reaction is like, yo, let's cat that flag. Mm, looks a little wonky. Got some, uh, got some other hex display, apparently. This looks like a hex dump. This looks like uh, something that XXD would put out. Or if you're opening it up in a hex editor, like hex edit, or what is it, gex or bless. I know there are a couple others that some folks might like. Uh, thing is, if we were to try and recover this, it's not going to end up being a readable plain text flag. You can kind of see the ASCII representation over on the side here. And that's not what we want. We kind of want the real thing. Uh, if I were to do that though, if I were to just cat out that flag.txt, you can pipe it into xxd tac r because that tac r will like recover or restore it. We can check that out. Checking out the man page here. Yep, searching for tac r, reverse operation, convert or patch hex dump into the binary. Good enough. So if we were to actually do that, pass that in, we just get that nonsense though that we had seen on that right hand side. We could redirect this into like a new file but then running file on new file, it's not going to give us anything interesting. So there must be something else at play here. And that's why we want to go check out that other file. So let's open this cc.png. And that is apparently a picture of CyberChef. I don't know if anyone might have recognized this, but it looks like it's using XOR with the key of one. However, UTF-8 encoding there. Standard scheme and uh, to the hex dump. Okay, so that must be how it had done this. Part of me wonders if we could do that in Python because I, I went down this road of using XXD, like using command line stuff, and now I just want to see, hey, can I actually finish that? Um, I'll open up Python 3 and I'll import like XOR from pwn. So actually, let me do that. Uh, from pwn, import XOR. And when I say pwn, I'm using pwn tools, right? So now I have the XOR function where I can just XOR like literally anything with literally anything else. I have an extra, I have an extra comma in there. My OCD, our OCD, the internet's OCD is going to go crazy. Uh, let's go ahead and just simply open up that flag.txt. Well, actually we called it new file, right? Uh, so let's read all those bytes out of it and uh, let's just read that data. So let's say, uh, XOR, there we go, is now going to be that value in bytes. But if I were to try and run XOR, the pwn tools function XOR, with the XOR data and the number one, that's not going to work for us. Um, part of me wonders if I could just pass it as a string, and it looks like I could. Uh, if I were to actually just make that a byte and ensure like, yo, let's use that proper encoding for encode.utf8, there we go. We still get our flag, storm CTF, misc1, f1d, 45, f, et cetera, et cetera. Nice. Easy peasy. That's how we could do it in Python. Obviously, yeah, if you wanted to fire up uh, CyberChef, you totally could. So let me do that. I'll go to uh, CyberChef. And little thing, in case you didn't know, you can actually upload a file into CyberChef. You probably already knew that. Maybe that's like totally old hat to most everyone. Uh, it blew my mind. <laughs> so that, I don't know, goes to show. You can add this, uh, like this arrow here. Yeah. Open file as input. And then you can go ahead and like search for it with your file browser. So, uh, where did I just put this? Oh, let me go to, uh, my YouTube Kirby one and zip new file dot zip because if you were to try and copy and paste all of these non-printable characters, it wouldn't work. It just wouldn't be the exact same data. And that's why in this case, we kind of like have to upload that to, uh, to CyberChef. And the properties of XOR tell us that, hey, if we were to just XOR that same data, 
with the key of one, but don't forget they're actually using that UTF-8 encoding. So you have to click on that drop down box here, specify that. Now you've got your flag and that challenge is done. That took 10 minutes and it really shouldn't have, but hey, I hope we explained it all and you had a good time. So uh, let's dive into something else here. Now that we finished up that YouTube Kirby, let's go ahead and create a directory for YouTube Alphabet. So hopping into this challenge, I'll scroll up here. You should be able to see that we have some Docker container information. Uh, I had started a Docker container to prompt this open. Um, and this was really kind of nice. So I like the fact that we can go ahead and spin up our own uh, per user instances or whatever for these challenges. And uh, we're given the challenge host and the port number. So I'm assuming I can netcat to this and I will paste in that host and IP address info. I'll also paste in the port number. So when I net cat to it, I get this response and it says, give me up to 100 bytes and I'll encode it in base 64. Okay. So let's please sub. Mm. That doesn't look like normal base 64. <laughs> so it says, what was the base 64 alphabet that I used? Uh, I have no idea. Incorrect. Okay. The answer was that thing. <laughs> Goodbye. So, okay. Looks like what we have to do is figure out and determine what base 64 alphabet they might be using. Um, I'm going to assume that the alphabet will change each time you connect to it because it just kind of told me the alphabet that it used. So if that's the answer that it's looking for. It's not just going to spill the beans and tell me. Uh, let's do another please sub. And there we go. Yeah, there's a completely different alphabet. However, it's weird to me because in base 64, you don't sit, you don't typically see characters like an exclamation point or a dollar sign or open curly brace ampersand percent sign, et cetera, et cetera. So they might be doing something peculiar here. Um, if we were to Google, right, if we were to just go ahead and take a look, let's go to base 64 over on Wikipedia, right? Um, Base64, and I've showcased this all the time, is a group of binary text encoding schemes that represent binary data. Um, it's so that typically you could pass data through a URL or some other transformation, <laughs> transferring information protocol um, that doesn't get into like non-safe characters like those exclamation points, ampersand, et cetera, et cetera. It's just going to end up using the printable characters for literally everything. Um, a through Z in uppercase and A through Z in lowercase and then numbers and a plus sign and a forward slash uh, and an equal sign for padding. So what do we need to do to solve this challenge to figure out what language it might be using for base 64? So I had tried to do a couple things here um, and I'll kind of walk through my thought process, but first let's get just a script. Uh, I'll call it solve.py because we're feeling pretty confident. And it will go with a Python shebang line. I'll zoom in on this here so you can see it. And uh, let's go ahead and import pwn tools. So uh, let's just do a from pwn import all. And I'll do that because we do need to go ahead and create a remote like tubes object or a socket object essentially in the pwn tools speak. Um, I'll call that like S for whatever for socket. Uh, and we'll need to specify the host and port information. So before I define that S variable or that object for the socket, we'll just say host and port can equal that information. Um, and I'll specify that IP address as a string, but this port can just remain as an integer. So S now can equal remote, which is a function we're gonna end up calling through the pwn tools namespace, even though we just brought it into the global context here. Uh, host and port, there we go. And then just for safekeeping, we'll close that socket and then we'll operate kind of in the middle here to keep writing our code. Obviously, just a simple sanity check. If we were to go ahead and run that, we get an open connection and a closed connection. So good enough. Let's go ahead and print 
our s dot receive and you don't need to pass in any arguments in this case because we're using pwn tools uh normally for like the regular boilerplate default socket library you might pass in like 4096 um we do however need to know what this thing looks like when it is waiting for a prompt it's just going to give us one line supposedly so let's actually receive until to force to make sure that we're waiting on our input so now we can get that prompt and then let's try and send some data to it the question is what do we want to send um i had thought originally when i was going through this like oh let's just send it all of those printable characters that you might see in regular base 64. now I spent a lot of time kind of going down this rabbit hole and then the epiphany hit me like a ton of bricks. And you might already know the answer. You might already know the trick and the gimmick as to what to do. Uh, please bear with me. I'm going to showcase just my thought process kind of going through it. But uh, let's let's grab the Base64 module because we are going to be doing some of our own Base64 encoding stuff. So let's go ahead and determine the string that we'll send. We'll call it like simple to send, whatever. Um, we want our A, B, C, D, E, F, G, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm gonna actually import that from the string library. So that way I can use string.ascii uppercase and string.ascii lowercase and actually make that lowercase before I forget. Add in our string dot digits and then add in just a string of the plus sign and the forward slash. There we go. So now we have all of the base 64 kind of characters that might end up being included in a regular base 64 encoded string. So there we go. That is our entire set. You can see that that is, if I paste it in here, 64 characters selected, right? Kind of down at the bottom, hence the name base64. Now, when we connected over and over again, when we were using Netcat and we would just be like, hey, please sub, uh, the alphabet that it told us gave us seemingly 65 characters because it included that equal sign at the very, very end, right? So I'll copy this. And uh, now you can see I have 65 characters selected on the very bottom of my left screen screen here. So I'll actually make sure we include that equal sign. Cool. Okay. Now we can go ahead and send this, right? So let's do a s dot send line uh, to send and let's see what we receive. There we go. Um, let's go ahead and run this. Okay. So now that data that's returned is going to end up being that encoded with whatever language that it chose. And of course, it's going to be different every single time. So um, let's actually, it's going to be bytes here, but let's strip that of the new line character at the very, very end. And let's decode that from like UTF-8. And it's going to ask us next, hey, what language or what is the alphabet that I use? And then we're going to be prompted for an answer. So for the sake of our own ex exploration, I'm actually just going to send nothing. So it will tell us what that library, what that alphabet that it used was. So we'll send nothing and then we will wait to receive. Actually, it tells us, nope, sorry, that's incorrect. The answer was all of this and it'll tell us the alphabet. So for our own understanding, now we could carve out that information. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and like split on spaces and just get the very, very last one. So split and let's get the very, very last occurrence. Now we should see, okay, that is the alphabet that they used. We don't need to print out this portion anymore when it prompts us, hey, what was that? Um, but we see our new encoded rendition and their new library. So what could we do here? Uh, I'll show you. Rather than doing this print for the very, very first one, I'm actually going to make this a little function. Um, so I could get one encoded representation of a 
M, I guess, or a message, because I can't use string or I don't want to use that string variable because it uh, it's already being used by that module. So the to send, I really can move out because now that get encoded function will end up being a function that can take in an argument or will pass in a message here. So we'll send line message and then we will receive until to get what it was encoded. So uh, they're encoding, I guess they're encoded. And then we'll determine what the alphabet was. So their alphabet. Good, good, good. And now once that's done, we can simply return their encoded and their alphabet. So we could kind of examine those. Now, once we've done all that, I kind of just want to put all these side by side so we can look at them. And I promise I, I'm not going to drive us into this wall for all that much longer. I just kind of want to showcase this and visualize what I was thinking. Um, let me go ahead and print out our, mm, what do we want to send? Because our alphabet is actually going to end up being this rather than our original two send. We'll call that our alphabet. So our alphabet can equal, and I'll use an F string here. Good. We'll say our message, and we'll just say message equals, please subscribe. Duh. We could actually just send the whole alphabet. Do we want to send the whole alphabet? Let's just, yeah, let's just send our alphabet. I hope that's not too confusing, but our message can equal that. Um, and I'm going to add some spaces in here so we can see it. But then let's go ahead and get their encoded and their alphabet. And actually, we don't even want to send our message out because we kind of already know what it is. We should get our encoded, which can be a regular base64 encoding of this. Base64.b64 encode of our message, right? So our encoded. The reason that I'm doing this is that I want to see if there's a relationship or some sort of mapping between how our, how our base64 looks when we render it normally or we encode it with a natural base64 encoding or uh, and, and how it compares right to their encoded when they use their own custom language. So once we get the encoded rendition of our message, then we can display our alphabet, their alphabet, our message, their, et cetera, et cetera. So our encoded and their encoded, good, and their alphabet. Um, we are going to make a little bit more room. Their alphabet and their encoded. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go. Let's run this. Let's just see how it looks so I can get this kind of idea across. And it needs bytes, of course. So our message should actually be encoded as UTF-8. Let's see how that looks. There we go. Our message is not defined. Uh, get encoded uh, message is what that should be called, not our message. Now let's try that. Okay. Um, uh, the logging is kind of getting in the middle. So I'm going to actually turn that off. I'm going to use context.log level. I'll set that to critical. So that way pwn tools won't display all that debugging information. Okay. Now, oh, our encoded is going to be base 64 with a, with a bytes thing there. But, uh, let's, let's, let's decode that decode. UTF-8. There we go. Okay. So maybe this is hard to read or maybe this is weird um, because kind of it, it's, it's lengthy and long. We should send a smaller string. How about that? Uh, so rather than message being our alphabet, let's just use message to be that 
please subscribe. I keep changing my mind, you know? How about that? Okay. Now, I won't harp on this for all that much longer. I promise. Uh, I will bring us to the solution idea. But I had a thought, and maybe, uh, maybe I'm misremembering it right now, but I noticed that our alphabet, when we encoded it, our capital A became a C. And when they, uh, oh shoot, uh, their alphabet. Let's try that again. <laughs> our A became a C. I have a space in there and that's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> our A became a C when we encoded it. Or I guess it, it's a P that we were sending because of a please subscribe. So maybe that maybe I'm getting this relationship completely wrong. However, when they encoded it, my uh, our letter P became an S, a lowercase S. So the C that we had lined up with this P, uh, or no. Oh, goodness, I'm dying. Let's... <laughs> oh, my goodness. This whole idea is falling apart. That's the hard part, because I was, like, trying to remember, like, what did, what relationship did I see? I know I saw something. Uh, our A becomes a capital Q. And that's, that is what we're sending here, right? So in the case of them... When we took our A, it became a lowercase s. So our Q over here, bringing that down vertically, you can see that their position of Q is an s. Um, am I down one way? No, 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 no. Oh, sorry, Q, Q. <laughs> <laughs> this this idea was getting was like really messing with my head. Uh, our encoded our original unencoded A became Q when it is encoded. So if we look at the position of Q in our alphabet, and if we were to take a look at what it was in their encoded rendition, our unde unencoded A became an S with their language. So that Q in our position an our alphabet became an S in their alphabet. So using that strange mapping, you could potentially figure out, okay, the location of what is what in uh, their encoded alphabet to know the each individual specific uh, letter translation in our alphabet versus their alphabet. However, that has a problem because what if some of the letters aren't included in their encoded response? Like, I don't see a capital A in here, do you? So what is it going to take to determine that capital A? Do we just keep sending it more stuff and hoping that we actually see the relationship and mapping? It's not always going to end up working out that way. So that I actually never saw work. Um, Actually, is that in my previous code? I never, I didn't write it on this machine. I wrote it on my laptop. Okay. So I guess we're not going to end up seeing that. That was the original thought. And maybe that was horrendously explained out loud. I, th I thought there was a relationship and there was, but it wouldn't get all of the data and all the information. So now that we've burned a whole lot of time, let's actually crank through this in the best way that we could. Um, rather than sending our original alphabet of all of the letters that you might find in base 64, all the capital A, lowercase letters, zero through nine digits and plus and, and forward slash. Here's the, here's the deal. Here's the gimmick. Let's take our message for what the normal alphabet would look like if you were to encode it with base 64 and do a normal base 64 decoding on it. So we'll decode it before we send it so we could see 
what it looks like and really what alphabet they're going to end up using when they use their alphabet. Like their encoding will look identical to their alphabet. And I'll, and I'll show you what I mean. So let's take our alphabet and let's base64 decode it. What we're going to end up sending. Let's decode that. Wonky idea, right? But now when we send that data, our original one will look like our message, except it's going to be the base64 encoded version. So when we send it to them, they will encode it with their language and it will just straight up tell us the language. Let me show you that. There we go. So A, B, C, D, blah, 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 blah. When we send it, their alphabet is going to be exactly their encoded representation, just about. So their encoded representation, actually up to 64 characters and then adding an equal sign in there, is going to be their alphabet every single time. Ta-da. 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 That's it. That's the gimmick. So what, we could just take that, right? We could just go ahead and uh, grab their encoded and let's say um, we think the alphabet is, right? Uh, found alphabet, I guess, can be their encoded value up to the 64th place, adding in an equal sign. And that's it. So found alphabet can equal the found alphabet. And that should match the alphabet that we retrieved from them as a proof of concept. Yep, it does. And it will every single time. So that is how you could determine what alphabet they'll be using. Now we just have to send it to them. So let's go ahead and do that. In our, let's just take the exact same code. We don't even need to run the uh, get encoded function, but let's just kind of take it. Here we go. Ta-da. So the message that we send is the base64 decoded alphabet. And when we retrieve it, we get their encoder representation. And now we'll send them the found alphabet that we determined from them. And then let's go ahead and do a s.receive. We don't need to force the broken alphabet down to the very, very bottom. So let's actually remove that last line there. But let's see if that will tell us the flag right away. Oh, it actually says incorrect. But it is in fact the exact same alphabet. We just saw that and we just tested it. Gimmick here and gotcha. Uh, when we use send line, I guess that it must be doing something. We were adding some other new line character in there and it is reading it literally and interpretively. Uh, so don't use send line and it will take it. Check it out. Ta-da. That's it. It's correct. And that is the alphabet challenge. I'm sorry I drug you through that. <laughs> like, uh, I didn't mean to do all that kind of verbose showcase there, but I think, I hope that that kind of explains the idea a little bit more or you get to see some of the thought process and the side-by-side -side as to how all these things look when they're working together. So we did it. Like, that's it. We could uh, just re find all and like carve out that flag uh, if we wanted to make our script a little bit more formal, but we solved it. And I think that's all that we really should do in this video because this came, this, this got to be a little bit more uh, long and lengthy than I expected. But uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed that pace. I didn't want to go like blazingly fast through this, but I hope it was in good and enjoyable. And uh, thanks so much for watching. I, I do want to do more of the guide point security capture the flag videos. Uh, it's kind of just a matter of me making time to record them. And uh, there's, you know, like a lot on everyone's plate. Life gets in the way and all. So, uh, but there are, there are some plans and I do want to showcase more of them. I, 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 knew there are, I know there are a good few challenges that I do want to uh, bring to you. 
All right, that's the end of the video, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Please do all the YouTube algorithm things. Please like the video, comment the video, subscribe to the video, and I would love to see you in the next video. Thanks, everybody. Bye.